Section 7 of Pamela or Virtue Rewarded. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pamela or Virtue Rewarded by Samuel Richardson. Section 7. Meantime, Mrs. Jervis and all the family were in the utmost grief for the trick put upon the poor Pamela and she and the steward represented it to their master in as moving terms as they durst, but were forced to rest satisfied with his general assurances of intending her no harm, which, however, Mrs. Jervis little believed, from the pretense he had made in his letter, of the correspondence between Pamela and the young parson, which she knew to be all mere invention, though she durst not say so. But the week after they were made a little more easy by the following letter, brought by an unknown hand and left for Mrs. Jervis, which, now procured, will be shown in the sequel. Dear Mrs. Jervis, I have been vilely tricked, and, instead of being driven by Robin to my dear father's, I am carried off to where I have no liberty to tell. However, I am at present not used hardly in the main, and write to beg of you to let my dear father and mother, whose hearts must be well-nigh broken, know that I am well, and that I am, and, by the grace of God, ever will be, their honest as well as dutiful daughter, and your obliged friend, Pamela Andrews. I must neither send date nor place, but have most solemn assurances of honorable usage. This is the only time my low estate has been troublesome to me, since it has subjected me to the frights I have undergone. Love to your good self and all my dear fellow servants. Adieu, adieu, but pray for poor Pamela. This, though it quieted not entirely their apprehensions, was shown to the whole family, and to the gentleman himself, who pretended not to know how it came, and Mrs. Jervis sent it away to the good old folks, who at first suspected it was forged, and not their daughter's hand, but, finding the contrary, they were a little easier to hear that she was alive and honest, and having inquired of all their acquaintance what could be done, and no one being able to put them in a way how to proceed with effect on so extraordinary an occasion against so rich and so resolute a gentleman, and being afraid to make matters worse, though they saw plainly enough that she was in no bishop's family, and so mistrusted all the rest of his story, they applied themselves to prayers for their poor daughter, and for an happy issue to an affair that almost distracted them. We shall now leave the honest old pair praying for their dear Pamela, and return to the account she herself gives of all this, having written it journal-wise, to amuse and employ her time, in hopes some opportunity might offer to send it to her friends, and, as was her constant view, that she might afterwards thankfully look back upon the dangers she had escaped, when they should be happily overblown, as in time she hoped they would be, and that then she might examine and either approve or repent of her own conduct in them. Letter 32 O oh, my dearest father and mother! Let me write and bewail my miserable hard fate, though I have no hope how what I can write can be conveyed to your hands. I have now nothing to do but write and weep, and fear and pray. Yet what can I hope for, when I seem to be devoted as a victim to the will of a wicked violator of all the laws of God and man. But, gracious heaven, forgive me my rashness and despondency. Oh, let me not sin against thee, for thou best knowest what is fittest for thy poor handmaid. And as thou sufferest not thy poor creatures to be tempted above what they can bear, I will resign myself to thy good pleasure. And still, I hope, desperate as my condition seems, that as these trials are not of my own seeking, nor the effects of my presumption and vanity, I shall be enabled to overcome them, and, in God's own good time, be delivered from them. Thus do I pray imperfectly, as I am forced by my distracting fears and apprehensions, and, oh, join with me, my dear parents! But, alas, how can you know, how can I reveal to you, the dreadful situation of your poor daughter? The unhappy Pamela may be undone, which God forbid, and sooner deprive me of life, before you can know her hard lot. Oh, the unparalleled wickedness, stratagems, and devices, 
of those who call themselves gentlemen, yet pervert the design of providence in giving them ample means to do good, to their own everlasting perdition, and the ruin of poor oppressed innocence. But now I will tell you what has befallen me, and yet, how shall you receive it? Here is no honest John to carry my letters to you, and besides I am watched in all my steps, and no doubt shall be, till my hard fate may ripen his wicked projects for my ruin. I will every day, however, write my sad state, and some way, perhaps, may be opened to send the melancholy scribble to you. But alas, when you know it, what will it do but aggravate your troubles? For, oh, what can the abject poor do against the mighty rich, when they are determined to oppress? Well, but I must proceed to write what I had hoped to tell you in a few hours, when I believed I should receive your grateful blessings on my return to you from so many hardships. I will begin with my account from the last letter I wrote you, in which I enclosed my poor stuff of verses, and continue it at times as I have opportunity, though, as I said, I know not how it can reach you. The long-hoped-for Thursday morning came when I was to set out. I had taken my leave of my fellow servants overnight, and a mournful leave it was to us all for men as well as women servants, wept much to part with me, and, for my part, I was overwhelmed with tears and the affecting instances of their esteem. They all would have made me little presents as tokens of their love, but I would not take anything from the lower servants to be sure. But Mr. Longman would have me accept of several yards of Holland and a silver snuff-box and a gold ring, which he desired me to keep for his sake and he wept over me, but said, I am sure so good a maiden God will bless, and though you return to your poor father again, and his low estate, yet providence will find you out. Remember I tell you so, and one day, though I mayn't live to see it, you will be rewarded. I said, Oh, dear Mr. Longman, you make me too rich and too modi and yet I must be a beggar before my time, for I shall want often to be scribbling, little thinking it would be my only employment so soon. And I will beg you, sir, to favor me with some paper, and as soon as I get home I will write you a letter to thank you for all your kindness to me, and a letter to good Mrs. Jervis, too. This was lucky, for I should have had none else but at the pleasure of my rough-natured governess, as I may call her but now I can write to ease my mind, though I can't send it to you, and write what I please, for she knows not how well I am provided, for good Mr. Longman gave me above forty sheets of paper, and a dozen pens, and a small file of ink, which last I wrapped in paper and put in my pocket, and some wax and wafers. Oh, dear sir, said I, you have set me up. How shall I requite you? He said, by a kiss, my fair mistress, and I gave it very willingly, for he is a good old man. Rachel and Hannah cried sadly when I took my leave, and Jane, who sometimes used to be a little crossish, and Cicely, too, wept sadly and said they would pray for me. But poor Jane, I doubt, will forget that, for she seldom says her prayers for herself, more's the pity. Then Arthur the gardener, our Robin the coachman, and Lincolnshire Robin, too, who was to carry me, were very civil, and both had tears in their eyes, which I thought then very good-natured in Lincolnshire Robin, because he knew but little of me. But since, I find he might well be concerned, for he had then his instructions, it seems, and knew how he was to be a means to entrap me. Then our other three footmen, Harry, Isaac, and Benjamin, and grooms and helpers, were very much affected likewise, and the poor little scullion boy, Tommy, was ready to run over for grief. They had got all together overnight, expecting to be differently employed in the morning, and they all begged to shake hands with me, and I kissed the maidens and prayed to God to bless them all, and thanked them for all their love and kindness to me, and, indeed, I was forced to leave them sooner than I would, because I could not stand it. Indeed, I could not. Harry, I could not have thought it, for he was a little wildish, they say, cried till he sobbed again. John, poor honest John, was not then come back from you, but as for the butler, Mr. Jonathan, 
he could not stay in company. I thought to have told you a deal about this, but I have worse things to employ my thoughts. Mrs. Jervis, good Mrs. Jervis, cried all night long, and I comforted her all I could, and she made me promise that if my master went to London to attend Parliament, or to Lincolnshire, I would come and stay a week with her, and she would have given me money, but I would not take it. Well, next morning came, and I wondered I saw nothing of poor honest John, for I waited to take leave of him and thank him for all his civilities to me and to you, but I suppose he was sent farther by my master, and so could not return, and I desired to be remembered to him. And when Mrs. Jervis told me, with a sad heart, the chariot was ready with four horses to it, I was just upon sinking to the ground, though I wanted to be with you. My master was above stairs, and never asked to see me. I was glad of it in the main, but he knew, false heart as he is, that I was not to be out of his reach. Oh, preserve me, heaven, from his power and from his wickedness! Well, they were not suffered to go with me one step, as I writ to you before, for he stood at the window to see me go, and in the passage to the gate, out of his sight, there they stood, all of them, in two rows, and we could say nothing on both sides, but God bless you, and God bless you. But Harry carried my own bundle, my third bundle, as I was used to call it, to the coach, with some plum cake and diet bread, made for me overnight, and some sweet meats, and six bottles of canary wine, which Mrs. Jervis would make me take in a basket, to cheer our hearts now and then, when we got together, as she said. And I kissed all the maids again, and shook hands with the men again, but Mr. Jonathan and Mr. Longman were not there, and then I tripped down the stairs to the chariot, Mrs. Jervis crying most sadly. I looked up when I got to the chariot, and I saw my master at the window in his gown, and I curtsied three times to him very low, and prayed for him with my hands lifted up, for I could not speak. Indeed, I was not able." and he bowed his head to me, which made me then very glad he would take such notice of me. And in I stepped, and was ready to burst with grief, and could only, till Robin began to drive, wave my white handkerchief to them, wet with my tears. And at last away he drove, Jehu-like, as they say, out of the courtyard. And I too soon found I had cause for greater and deeper grief. Well, said I to myself, at this rate I shall soon be with my dear father and mother, until I had got, as I supposed, half-way, I thought of the good friends I had left, and when, on stopping for a little bait to the horses, Robin told me I was near half-way, I thought it was high time to wipe my eyes, and think to whom I was going. As then, alack for me, I thought. So I began to ponder what a meeting I should have with you, how glad you'd both be to see me come safe and innocent to you, after all my dangers, and so I began to comfort myself, and to banish the other gloomy side from my mind, though, too, it returned now and then, for I should be ungrateful not to love them for their love. Well, I believe I set out about eight o'clock in the morning, and I wondered and wondered, when it was about two, as I saw by a church dial, in a little village as we passed through, that I was still more and more out of my knowledge. Heyday, thought I, to drive this strange pace, and to be so long a-going a little more than twenty miles, is very odd. But to be sure, thought I, Robin knows the way. At last he stopped and looked about him, as if he was at a loss for the road, and I said, Mr. Robert, sure you are out of the way. I'm afraid I am, said he, but it can't be much. I'll ask the next person I see. Pray do, said I, and he gave his horses a mouthful of bay, and I gave him some cake and two glasses of canary wine, and stopped about half an hour in all. Then he drove on very fast again. I had so much to think of, of the dangers I now doubted not I had escaped, of the loving friends I had left, and my best friends I was going to, and the many things I had to relate to you, that I the less thought of the way, till I was startled out of my meditations by the sun beginning to set, and still the man driving on, and his horses sweating and foaming, and then I began to be alarmed all at once, and called to him, 
and he said he had horrid ill luck, for he had come several miles out of the way, but was now right, and should get in still before it was quite dark. My heart began then to misgive me a little, and I was very much fatigued, for I had no sleep for several nights before, to signify. And at last I said, Pray, Mr. Robert, there is a town before us, what do you call it? If we are too much out of the way, we had better put up there, for the night comes on apace. And, Lord, protect me, thought I, I shall have new dangers, mayhap, to encounter with the man, who have escaped the master, little thinking of the base contrivance of the latter. Says he, I am just there, tis but a mile on one side of the town before us. Nay, said I, I may be mistaken, for it is a good while since I was this way, but I am sure the face of the country here is nothing like what I remember it. He pretended to be much out of humor with himself for mistaking the way, and at last stopped at a farmhouse about two miles beyond the village I had seen. And it was then almost dark, and he alighted and said, We must make shift here, for I am quite out. Lord, thought I, be good to the poor Pamela, more trials still, what will befall me next? The farmer's wife and maid and daughter came out, and the wife said, What brings you this way at this time of night, Mr. Robert, and with a lady too? Then I began to be frightened out of my wits, and laying middle and both ends together, I fell a-crying and said, God give me patience, I am undone for certain. Pray, mistress, said I, do you know Squire B. of Bedfordshire? The wicked coachman would have prevented the answering me, but the simple daughter said, No, his worship, yes, surely. Why, he is my father's landlord. Well, said I, then I am undone, undone for ever. O oh, wicked wretch, what have I done to you, said I to the coachman, to serve me thus, vile tool of a wicked master? Faith, said the fellow, I am sorry this task was put upon me, but I could not help it, but make the best of it now. Here are very civil, reputable folks, and you'll be safe here, I'll assure you. Let me get out, said I, and I'll walk back to the town we came through, late as it is, for I will not enter here. Said the farmer's wife, You'll be very well used here, I'll assure you, young gentlewoman, and have better conveniences than anywhere in the village. I matter not conveniences, said I, I am betrayed and undone. As you have a daughter of your own, pity me, and let me know if your landlord, as you call him, be here. No, I'll assure you he is not, said she. And then came the farmer, a good-like sort of man, grave and well-behaved, and spoke to me in such sort, as made me a little pacified, and seeing no help for it, I went in, and the wife immediately conducted me upstairs to the best apartment, and told me that was mine as long as I stayed, and nobody should come near me but when I called. I threw myself on the bed in the room, tired and frightened to death almost, and gave way to the most excessive fit of grief that I ever had. The daughter came up and said, Mr. Robert had given her a letter to give me, and there it was. I raised myself, and saw that it was the hand and seal of the wicked wretch, my master, directed to Mrs. Pamela Andrews. This was a little better than to have him here, though if he had, he must have been brought through the air, for I thought I was. The good woman, for I begin to see things about, a little reputable, and no guile appearing in them, but rather a face of grief for my grief, offered me a glass of some cordial water, which I accepted, for I was ready to sink, and then I sat up in a chair a little, though very faintish, and they brought me two candles, and lighted a brushwood fire, and said, if I called, I should be waited on instantly, and so left me to ruminate on my sad condition, and to read my letter, which I was not able to do presently. After I had a little come to myself, I found it to contain these words. Dear Pamela, the passion I have for you, and your obstinacy, have constrained me to act by you in a manner that I know will occasion you great trouble and fatigue, both of mind and body. Yet forgive me, my dear girl, for, although I have taken this step, I will, by all that's good and holy, use you honorably. 
suffer not your fears to transport you to a behavior that will be disreputable to us both. For the place where you'll receive this is a farm that belongs to me, and the people civil, honest, and obliging. You will, by this time, be far on your way to the place I have allotted for your abode for a few weeks, till I have managed some affairs that will make me show myself to you in a much different light than you may possibly apprehend from this rash action. And to convince you that I mean no harm, I do assure you that the house you are going to shall be so much at your command that even I myself will not approach it without leave from you. So make yourself easy, be discreet and prudent, and a happier turn shall reward these your troubles than you may at present apprehend. Meantime, I pity the fatigue you will have if this come to your hand in the place I have directed, and will write to your father to satisfy him that nothing but what is honorable shall be offered to you by your passionate admirer, so I must style myself, blank. Don't think hardly of poor Robin. You have so possessed all my servants in your favor that I find they had rather serve you than me and tis reluctantly the poor fellow undertook this task, and I was forced to submit to assure him of my honorable intentions to you, which I am fully resolved to make good, if you compel me not to a contrary conduct. I but too well apprehended that this letter was only to pacify me for the present, but as my danger was not so immediate as I had reason to dread, and he had promised to forbear coming to me, and to write to you, my dear parents, to quiet your concern, I was a little more easy than before, and I made shift to eat a little bit of boiled chicken they had got for me, and drink a glass of my sack, and made each of them do so too. But after I had so done, I was again a little flustered, for in came the coachman with a look of a hangman, I thought, and madamed me up strangely, telling me, he would beg me to get ready to pursue my journey by five in the morning, or else he should be late in. I was quite grieved at this, for I began not to dislike my company, considering how things stood, and was in hopes to get a party among them, and so to put myself into any worthy protection in the neighborhood, rather than go forward. When he withdrew, I began to tamper with the farmer and his wife. But, alas, they had a letter delivered them at the same time I had, so securely had Lucifer put it into his head to do his work, and they only shook their heads and seemed to pity me, and so I was forced to give over that hope. However, the good farmer showed me his letter, which I copied as follows, for it discovers the deep arts of this wicked master, and how resolved he seems to be on my ruin, by the pains he took to deprive me of all hopes of freeing myself from his power. Farmer Norton, I send to your house, for one night only, a young gentlewoman, much against her will, who has deeply embarked in a love affair, which will be her ruin, as well as the persons to whom she wants to betroth herself. I have, to oblige her father, ordered her to be carried to one of my houses, where she will be well used, to try, if by absence and expostulation with both, they can be brought to know their own interest, and I am sure you will use her kindly for my sake. For, excepting this matter, which she will not own, she does not want prudence and discretion. I will acknowledge any trouble you shall be at in this matter the first opportunity, and am your friend and servant. He had said, too cunningly for me, that I would not own this pretended love affair, so that he had provided them not to believe me say what I would and as they were his tenants, who all love him, for he has some amiable qualities, and so he had need, I saw all my plot cut out, and so was forced to say the less. I wept bitterly, however, for I found he was too hard for me, as well in his contrivances as riches, and so had recourse again to my only refuge, comforting myself that God never fails to take the innocent heart into his protection, and is alone able to baffle and confound the devices of the mighty. Nay, the farmer was so prepossessed with the contents of his letter, that he began to praise his care and concern for me, and to advise me against entertaining addresses without my friend's advice and consent, and made me the subject of a lesson for his daughter's improvement. 
so I was glad to shut up this discourse, for I saw I was not likely to be believed. I sent, however, to tell my driver that I was so fatigued I could not get out so soon the next morning. But he insisted upon it, and said, it would make my day's journey the lighter, and I found he was a more faithful servant to his master, notwithstanding what he wrote of his reluctance, than I could have wished. I saw still more and more that all was deep dissimulation, and contrivance worse and worse. Indeed, I might have shown them his letter to me as a full confutation of his to them, but I saw no probability of engaging them on my behalf, and so thought it signified little, as I was to go away so soon, to enter more particularly into the matter with them. And besides, I saw they were not inclinable to let me stay longer, for fear of disobliging him, so I went to bed, but had very little rest. And they would make their servant-maid bear me company in the chariot five miles, early in the morning, and she was to walk back. I had contrived in my thoughts, when I was on my way in the chariot on Friday morning, that when we came into some town to bait, as he must do for the horse's sake, I would at the inn apply myself, if I saw I any way could, to the mistress of the inn, and tell her the case, and to refuse to go farther, having nobody but this wicked coachman to contend with. Well, I was very full of this project, and in great hopes, somehow or other, to extricate myself in this way. But, oh, the artful wretch had provided for even this last refuge of mine, for when we came to put up at a large town on the way, to eat a morsel for dinner, and I was fully resolved to execute my project, who should be at the inn that he put up at, but the wicked Mrs. Jukes expecting me. And her sister-in-law was the mistress of it, and she had provided a little entertainment for me. And this I found, when I desired, as soon as I came in, to speak with the mistress of the house. She came to me, and I said, I am a poor unhappy young body, that want your advice and assistance, and you seem to be a good sort of gentlewoman, that would assist an oppressed innocent person. Yes, madam, said she, I hope you guess right, and I have the happiness to know something of the matter before you speak. Pray call my sister Jukes. Jukes, Jukes, thought I, I have heard that name, I don't like it. Then the wicked creature appeared, whom I had never seen but once before, and I was terrified out of my wits. No stratagem, thought I, not one, for a poor innocent girl, but everything to turn out against me, that is hard indeed. So I began to pull in my horns, as they say, for I saw I was now worse off than at the farmer's. The naughty woman came up to me with an air of confidence and kissed me. See, sister, said she, here's a charming creature. Would she not tempt the first lord in the land to run away with her? Oh, frightful, thought I. Here's an avowal of the matter at once. I am now gone, that's certain. And so was quite silent and confounded. And seeing no help for it, for she would not part with me out of her sight, I was forced to set out with her in the chariot, for she came thither on horseback, with a manservant, who rode by us the rest of the way, leading her horse. And now I gave over all thoughts of redemption, and was in a desponding condition indeed. Well, thought I, here are strange pains taken to ruin a poor innocent, helpless, and even worthless young body. This plot is laid too deep, and has been too long hatching, to be baffled, I fear. But then I put my trust in God, who I knew was able to do everything for me, when all other possible means should fail, and in him I was resolved to confide. You may see, yet, oh, that kills me, for I know not whether ever you can see what I write now or no, else you will see, what sort of woman that Mrs. Jukes is, compared with the good Mrs. Jervis, by this. Every now and then she would be staring in my face, in the chariot, and squeezing my hand, and saying, Why, you are very pretty, my silent dear. And once she offered to kiss me. But I said, I don't like this sort of carriage, Mrs. Jukes. It is not like two persons of one sex. She fell a-laughing very confidently, and said, That's prettily said, I vow. Then thou hadst rather be kissed by the other sex? I, Fackins, I commend thee for that. 
I was sadly teased with her impertinence and bold way. But no wonder. She was innkeeper's housekeeper before she came to my master, and those sort of creatures don't want confidence, you know, and indeed she made nothing to talk boldly on twenty occasions, and said two or three times, when she saw the tears every now and then, as we rid, trickle down my cheeks, I was sorely hurt, truly, to have the handsomest and finest young gentleman in five counties in love with me. So I find I am got into the hands of a wicked procuress, and if I was not safe with good Mrs. Jervis, and where everybody loved me, what a dreadful prospect have I now before me, in the hands of a woman that seems to delight in filthiness. Oh, dear sirs, what shall I do? What shall I do? Surely I shall never be equal to all these things. About eight at night we entered the courtyard of this handsome, large, old and lonely mansion, that looks made for solitude and mischief, as I thought, by its appearance, with all its brown nodding horrors of lofty elms and pines about it. And here, said I to myself, I fear is to be the scene of my ruin, unless God protect me, who is all-sufficient. I was very sick at entering it, partly from fatigue, and partly from dejection of spirits, and Mrs. Jukes got me some mulled wine, and seemed mighty officious to welcome me thither and while she was absent ordering the wine, the wicked robin came in to me and said, I beg a thousand pardons for my part in this affair, since I see your grief and your distress, and I do assure you that I am sorry it fell to my task. Mighty well, Mr. Robert, said I. I never saw an execution but once, and then the hangman asked the poor creature's pardon and wiped his mouth as you do, and pleaded his duty and then calmly tucked up the criminal. But I am no criminal, as you all know, and if I could have thought it my duty to obey a wicked master in his unlawful command, I had saved you all the merit of this vile service. I am sorry, said he, you take it so, but everybody don't think alike. Well, said I, you have done your part, Mr. Robert, towards my ruin very faithfully and will have cause to be sorry, maybe, at the long run, when you shall see the mischief that comes of it. Your eyes were open, and you knew I was to be carried to my father's, and that I was barbarously tricked and betrayed, and I can only, once more, thank you for your part of it. God forgive you. So he went away a little sad. What have you said to Robin, madame? said Mrs. Jukes, who came in as he went out the poor fellow's ready to cry. I need not be afraid of your following his example, Mrs. Jukes, said I. I have been telling him that he has done his part to my ruin, and he now can't help it. So his repentance has done me no good. I wish it may him. I'll assure you, madame, said she, I should be as ready to cry as he if I should do you any harm. It is not in his power to help it now, said I but your part is to come, and you may choose whether you'll contribute to my ruin or not. Why, look ye, madame, said she, I have a great notion of doing my duty to my master, and therefore you may depend upon it, if I can do that and serve you, I will. But you must think, if your desire and his will come to clash once, I shall do as he bids me, let it be what it will. Pray, Mrs. Jukes, said I, don't madame me so. I am but a silly poor girl, set up by the gamble of fortune for a May game, and now am to be something, and now nothing, just as that thinks fit to sport with me. And let you and me talk upon a foot together, for I am a servant inferior to you, and so much the more as I am turned out of place. Ay, ay, says she, I understand something of the matter. You have so great power over my master, that you may soon be mistress of us all, and so I would oblige you if I could, and I must and will call you madame, for I am instructed to show you all respect, I'll assure you. Who instructed you so to do? said I. Who? My master, to be sure, said she. Why, said I, how can that be? You have not seen him lately. No, that's true, said she but I have been expecting you here some time. Oh, the deep-laid wickedness, thought I. 
and besides, I have a letter of instructions by Robin, but, maybe, I should not have said so much. If you would show them to me, said I, I should be able to judge how far I could, or could not, expect favor from you, consistent with your duty to your master. I beg your pardon, fair mistress, for that, said she, I am sufficiently instructed, and you may depend upon it, I will observe my orders, and, so far as they will let me, so far will I oblige you, and that's the end of it. Well, said I, you will not, I hope, do an unlawful or wicked thing for any master in the world. Look ye, said she, he is my master, and if he bids me do anything that I can do, I think I ought to do it, and let him, who has his power to command me, look to the lawfulness of it. Why, said I, suppose he should bid you cut my throat, would you do it? There is no danger of that, said she, but to be sure I would not, for then I should be hanged, for that would be murder. Well, said I, and suppose he should resolve to ensnare a poor young creature and ruin her, would you assist him in that? For to rob a person of her virtue is worse than cutting her throat. Why now, says she, how strangely you talk! Are not the two sexes made for one another? And is it not natural for a gentleman to love a pretty woman? And suppose he can obtain his desires, is that so bad as cutting her throat? And then the wretch fell a-laughing, and talked most impertinently, and showed me that I had nothing to expect from her virtue or conscience. And this gave me great mortification, for I was in hopes of working upon her by degrees. So we ended our discourse there, and I bid her show me where I must lie. Why, said she, lie where you list, madame. I can tell you, I must lie with you for the present. For the present, said I, and torture then wrung my heart. But it is in your instructions that you must lie with me? Yes, indeed, said she. I am sorry for it, said I. Why, said she, I am wholesome and cleanly too, I'll assure you. Yes, said I, I don't doubt that, but I love to lie by myself. How so, said she, was not Mrs. Jervis your bedfellow at t'other house? Well, said I, quite sick of her and my condition, you must do as you're instructed, I think. I can't help myself, and am a most miserable creature. She repeated her insufferable nonsense. Mighty miserable, indeed, to be so well beloved by one of the finest gentlemen in England. End of section 7